I'm Julie Zenner along with Dennis Anderson and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. The Minnesota DNR released the final environmental impact statement on the proposed polymet mine this afternoon. We'll have reaction from a company official. Voters in Duluth elected the city's first female mayor this week and the mayor-elect is here in the studio. And the city and the Lake Superior Zoological Board have agreed to a concept plan for the Duluth Zoo's future. These stories and more coming up on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching and plenty of anticipation for deer hunters on the eve of the season opener. Oh, Ginny. thousands of men and women strapping on the blaze orange this weekend. Huh? First right. thing tomorrow morning. And I hear all the bucks are hiding in Dennis's yard. They have been. <laughs> <laughs> we have a packed show tonight, Denny. So let's all right. Going. Thank you very much, Julie. <laughs> And welcome everyone to the program tonight. The Minnesota DNR released the final environmental impact statement on the Polymet Mine Project this afternoon. Now this is an important milestone for the company that wants to mine copper, nickel, and platinum group metals near Hoyt Lakes. But before the mine can proceed, local, state, and federal permit decisions remain. And here to tell us more about what's ahead is Letitia Geetson, Polymet's Director of Government and Community Relations. Thank you very much for being here, Letitia. What does the release of this DNR's final EIS say about the project itself? Well, it's a, it's a really exciting milestone for us. And what it says is, is that, and if you, there was a press release today and a press conference by DNR, and they basically said that the state and federal agencies that put the document together and their third party contractor, that we can meet all air and water quality standards uh, for the state and federal regulations. Now this is not a green light to begin mining immediately. Right, it's, it's an environmental review step. And so once this is completed, we can move into permitting. So it's a significant step in the environmental review process, but we still have to get the permits to start operating. Mm -hmm. And do they, does it stop short in terms of an endorsement of the project? So the, the agencies are really independent. Mm -hmm. They have to go through a process. There's rules and regulations that they need to follow. Um, and so the environmental review step, it's been a 10-year process. So it's kind of walking through each step and there's been a couple of iterations in the EIS that has caused um, significant improvements in the project. Um, but they don't really have a, it's not a red light or green light. It's a process that they follow. They need to make sure at the end of the day that the project can meet those state and federal uh, water quality standards. And um, what they released today says that we can. What are some of those improvements that have been made to the project because of this environmental impact statement study? Sure, I mean, we, there was an original draft that was um, out mm -hmm. in 2009 that had a lot of uh, uh, criticism. And one of the big differences was we were going through an environmental review for the project and a separate process for um, a land exchange. And um, there was also, we were not using RO technology, so we were not meeting the wild rice standard. And so EPA commented on that original draft um, and uh, caused an additional draft, the supplemental draft, which came out a few years ago. And so a lot of improvements, like including the land exchange and the EIS, um, as well as RO technology to make sure that we can meet the water quality standard for wild rice was added to the project. Mm -hmm. So now a 30-day public uh, comment period begins a week from today, I think it is, on the 13th of this month. Tell us about that. Sure, so the agencies again, DNR is the lead for mining projects, the U.S. Forest Service and Army Corps released this document, um, final version of it, and, and the next step would be adequacy. So they're basically asking folks to take a look at the adequacy of the document itself. And so that actually entails three different things. Um, it looks at back in the beginning of the process, there was a scoping, basically said this is the stuff we're gonna look at. Was that done? Did they study everything they said they were gonna do? The second thing that they have to do 
is look at the process. There's a federal environmental policy, national environmental policy, Minnesota Environmental Policy Act. Did they follow that process? And then the third thing is there were comments on the drafts and they have to uh, respond to those comments. So those are really the three tests of adequacy um, and that's what the comment period is. And then the agencies will look at those comments and then um, the state agency does an adequacy decision and the federal agencies do what are called a record of decision. Mm -hmm. Now already some environmental groups are coming out saying that they aren't satisfied. You can imagine that there will be some comments. Do you expect any legal challenges too along the yeah, way? Yeah, I mean when you when you look at the type of project that we're doing, a mining project, when you look at those anywhere across the U.S., they're always challenged. And so, you know, we, we've gone into this and that's part of the thing that um, the agencies have done too, is taken their time to make sure that when the legal challenges come, that the document w will withstand those challenges. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at projects like the Eagle Project, the recently permitted um, nickel project in Michigan, that was challenged many times um, throughout their process and now they're up and running. Should Polymet be begin mining at some point in the future, what kind of an economic impact will that company have on this region? It, it's huge. As part of the environmental review process, the University of Minnesota Duluth did a socioeconomic study looking just at St. Louis County. And when you look just at St. Louis County, it has a fi $515 million annual impact to the county. So very large um, impact, boost uh, to employment, spin-off jobs. There might right. be some people in northeastern Minnesota who someday would hope to work for PolyMet if PolyMet gets the, the final green light. Uh, what are you telling them right now? How long is that from today? You know, um, as we continue to get closer to permits, we'll, we'll start hiring people, not all 360 employees, but as we continue to get closer and start doing more um, in preparation and planning and engineering, we'll start hiring. So we're hoping to have permits by the end of 2016. So we will probably start hiring sometime, um, hopefully in the beginning part of 2016 and ramp up until we start construction. Mm -hmm. Now, Governor Dayton has said that PolyMet must set aside funds for reclamation. Um, any idea how much that will be and is the money put in place for that already? Sure, that's actually one of the requirements mm -hmm. is financial assurance and that actually comes in the permit to mine. Um, and so that's a process that we haven't fully started. Um, the permit to mine application will likely go in around the adequacy decision. Um, and so within that, the requirement to have financial assurance up front before we begin mining is part of that permit. Mm -hmm. And so the details of that will come in the permitting process. Mm -hmm. So what happens, uh, what happens next if people want to uh, participate in the public comment? Um, the agencies will have the um, information available on the, their website starting next week after it's in the federal register, they'll be able to submit comments to the adequacy of the document. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, well, Tisha Geetson, thank you very much for coming. Thank Appreciate you for your story. Us. Thank you. Now, let's dig into our news file archive for a look at what was making news 25 years ago this week. The legend lives on from the Chippewa home down of the big lake they call If Michigan. it hadn't been for Gordon Lightfoot's song, the fits would the be lake history. Is People wouldn't even remember the name. Gives up for dead when the skies of November it is on this day that we do remember the name of the Edmund Fitzgerald and the tragedy that struck 15 years ago when she plunged to the icy depths of Lake Superior. James Marshall has researched the famous shipwreck and still asks the $64,000 question. What in the world happened to that ship that night? No one really knows what happened that night, but anyone who cares has a theory. The Coast Guard's theory probably says the most and the least at the same time. It says the Edmund Fitzgerald suddenly lost buoyancy and sunk. Tom Holden of the Canal Park Marine Museum. Then I think one of, one of the wrecks where we know a lot about the wreck, but one of the things that hasn't come forward much lately, or much at all, is about those people, the 29 crewmen, the 29 families that were involved. Gordon Lightfoot has met many of the family members of the 29 men that went down with the ship, and with his famous song, touches their hearts and ours with how real a picture his lyrics paint. 
The most telling thing in the song, I think, is the uh, I think the phrase is that if they had just put 15 more miles behind them, um, that's true. If they had lasted another hour, hour and a half, if they could have just stayed afloat another hour and a half, we wouldn't be here today. The searchers all say they'd have made whitefish pay if they put 15 more miles behind her. History was made on election night in Duluth as citizens for the first time voted a woman into the mayor's office. Supporters of candidate for mayor Emily Larson gathered to watch the election returns Tuesday night at Clyde Ironworks in West Duluth. Even before the polls closed, anticipation was very high for a victory. And as the first ballots were counted from the city's 34 precincts, Larson pulled into the lead and went on to claim an overwhelming victory over opponent Chuck Horton. And joining us now is Emily Larson, the current president of the Duluth City Council and the next mayor of Duluth. Hello. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Really nice to be here. Thank you. What have these past few days been for you as the whole idea has kind of sunk in for you. Well, um, you know, wrapping up a campaign is a lot of work. So moving into the week, uh, we were door knocking, calling people, very focused mm -hmm. on getting people to vote, get out the vote, it's called. And so you move into Tuesday feeling oddly quiet and calm in some ways, because a lot of your work is done and you're still working to get people out. But then Wednesday sets in and that moment on Tuesday when you realize what you've worked really yeah. hard for with my yeah. family, with my kids, with our friends, it was just really nice. So the rest of the week we're kind of catching up and just today sure. feels like... Just breathing. breathing. Yeah, I feel like I can breathe. <laughs> well, Mayor-elect, yeah. what do you hope to accomplish in year number one? Well, I think this election, you know, partly the win margin and partly the way that the precincts went tells me that the direction the city's going and is one that people feel really good about. And so really it will be about uh, maintaining the momentum, especially in regards to economic development, mm -hmm. and then really, for me anyway, digging right back into the neighborhoods and, yeah. and ensuring neighborhood health and neighborhood equity. Having door knocked, that was really clear from neighborhoods that they want a, a, some connection there. Is, is there a way Duluth can raise new revenues? Yeah, well, and actually what we're doing this year, the budget that we're working with right now does have expanded uh, an expanded tax base, 2% of an expanded tax base over last year. So yes, what we need to do is to continue to grow our economy and to grow our tax base and that's one of the ways that we can continue. How would you grow the tax base? Yep. Yeah, well part of it is we continue to move our economic development in the ways that we have. We have some land that we're going to be putting back into a rotation whether it's Atlas, whether it's things happening down at Pier B, um, new industries that we need to be doing and so we, we're real solid in tourism and some other uh, areas but looking to expand those employer relationships to include more manufacturing and then housing, you know, bringing more property value and property taxation through expanded housing as well. Mm -hmm. As we mentioned in the intro, you will be Duluth's first female mayor. Mm -hmm. That's a, a big milestone for the city and for you. Um, do you see yourself uh, in some ways as a, a role model now for, for young women? Yeah, well, you know, that's, that's the part that's been really interesting this week, actually, uh -huh. because I didn't run for that reason. That was not... The component that compelled me to run at all it was really about a vision mm -hmm. and outlining um, a, other things that I was really passionate about in terms of our momentum and other other areas but it really did dawn on me this week the the reality of that and the responsibility that comes with it in the weeks leading up to this I had a lot of parents reach out which was really sweet and I, I had a lot of people I never met call me or email me and say you know my kid when you came to the door and we talked I shut the door and my seven-year-old ran up to me, daughter, and said, oh, maybe one day I'll be mayor too. And <laughs> a lot of women who, uh, one 82-year-old woman, yeah. just talked about what it meant for her to see a woman move into this office. And so I can see that it's meaningful. I feel that. And, and I could feel that Tuesday night as well. Mm -hmm. So we have a new mayor and we're also going to have a new city council being sworn in in January. <laughs> yes. So do you have a game plan, Emily, as to how to work with them? You do have city council experience. I do, which is really nice, actually, because I understand what that work is It's in that city councilors work incredibly hard and they're doing it in their own time in many ways. And so one of the things that I pride myself on is having good relationships with people, whether we share 
political values or not. And so it really will be a relationship based, um, you know, the, the way that I'll be working with counselors is to establish that early and to have individual relationships with everyone. So um, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to it. You know, we'll have some continuity in some of the counselors and then we'll have some new faces. And, and so I'll be getting to know some of those folks as the community is too. And it's, I think it's gonna be a really great next chapter mm -hmm. for Duluth. You, you've been in city government now for a number of years, mm -hmm. but did the race with Chuck Horton um, raise any issues that maybe you hadn't thought about before? He talked a lot about the drug issues yep. in, in town and, and some of the waste that he saw in city government. Anything strike you that said, yeah, there are people that really care about this and maybe government ought to be looking at it? Well, yeah, I mean, one of the things that campaigns do is mm -hmm. it really sharpens you. You have got to do your homework. You've yeah. got to get clear on not just what your values are, but what people are asking you and to be real honest about what the information is. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, through the series of those debates, different issues come up and certainly we spent time talking about drugs and we spent time talking about housing. We spent time talking about neighborhood equity and other things. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, what's really great is that we'll all kind of coalesce. You know, it drives the questions and it drives the conversations from the community. But really, um, you know, the foundation of, of the work I'll be doing will be based on the vision that, that we developed yeah. in this campaign and developed through the months of door knocking with neighbors. Voters mm -hmm. said yes to Lakeside Liquor. Will you pursue that with the state legislature? Yeah, you know, we're gonna talk about that as a council. I, I have looked a little bit at all of the precinct breakdowns, but I haven't gone through them, you know, with a fine tooth mm -hmm. comb yet. And so so it'll be interesting. I know Councillor Jennifer Jilsrud and I have already had a discussion a little bit on how to approach that, and so I'll be taking uh, taking her lead on some of that too. Mm -hmm. Now, publicly, you and Chuck very civil throughout the the mm -hmm. course of the campaign, but um, I'm a social media person. The social media stuff wasn't always so nice between mm -hmm. the the two camps. Mm -hmm. um, how do you how do you bring civility back into, well, into campaigns? And you can't control what your supporters you are can't. saying. They can't control what their yep. supporters are saying. But it got a little snarky. Well, and here's what's and really interesting. Um, you know, having campaigned before, mm -hmm. I, nothing surprised me about the campaign. Yeah. Actually, I mean, I, I understand that that's the nature and. Um, and social media is a, it's very live. People are looking for immediate response mm -hmm. and they're hooked and they kind of look through the next um, cycle. And so, you know, one of the things that we did as a campaign is, you know, never engaged that um, and, and set a tone that I, actually people really responded to me on the fact that we didn't kind of dig down and we didn't, um, you know, block out people's voices and people's opinions and we kind of let those threads go so people could see what others were saying and, and hold each other accountable. But, um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate when civility kind of takes a turn. What mm -hmm. I found is that, uh, you know, we have the Speak Your Peace Civility Project and our debates tended to be, stay very high level. And, and as a candidate and as a campaign, what you need to do is really stay here. You need to stay steady. You need to demonstrate that you know, regardless of where the narrative is going, mm -hmm. you can kind of see the light at the end because a lot of those cycles, they're, they're short. You know, they'll, they'll last for 12 hours or 24 hours. But if you remain consistent and you demonstrate, you know, your ability to just kind of stay calm amid mm -hmm. all of that, yep. it really, it shows. And I, I think mm -hmm. that, that actually showed in part of the results on Tuesday and, night. And that's a skill you're gonna need as you move forward. That's exactly so, right. Uh, that's thank exactly you so right. much. Thank you, Mary Elect. Thank, thank you. you.
After months of uncertainty, a vision for the future of Duluth Lake Superior Zoo was unveiled on Wednesday. A consensus plan was reached between the city, which owns the zoo, and the Lake Superior Zoological Society, which operates it. The new concept would downsize the zoo footprint and convert a portion of the current zoo into a free public park. Well, here to tell us more about the concept is John Scott, president of the Lake Superior Zoological Society Board. And Jim Philby Williams is director of public administration for the city of Duluth, but just reverse that. I think <laughs> <laughs> you two John. are. John. This uh, is John uh, and Jim. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. And we'll start with John. Okay. Um, talk about uh, the advantage of downsizing the zoo. Well, I think you have to be a little careful about the word downsizing because when we look at what the zoo is, it's, it's, a, it's a park. There have been pieces that have been within a fence and some that have not. But as uh, somebody who grew up uh, using the zoo uh, all along, there are obviously uh, many times in our, in our past where the zoo was not within a fence. I can remember days uh, sliding there. But th the point is that uh, we're taking and actually developing, I think, a very high quality um, outdoor um, animal exhibit area in the new plan. And that's pretty consistent with what we've had in the past. Yeah. Just it's gonna be a little more consolidated. It's gonna probably provide a better operating um, opportunity for us. But I think that we're going to be able to enhance outdoor exhibits uh, in a tremendous way where we have a lot of gaps in our space today. And in, and in looking at that, uh, that space is going to be much more valuable to the visitor because they're going to have a consistent path and an experience that's going to be um, something where it's exhibit, 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 and not so much open space. But I think the park space on the opposite side of the creek uh, really is going to provide us, I think, that, uh, that park experience that people uh, I think want and expect uh, out of uh, what Fairmont Park can be for us. Did you get a lot of input to keep the exotic animals at the zoo? I think we got a lot of input that people cherish our 92 year zoo tradition with all that it represents, including exotic animals. And so there's an openness um, to, uh, to changing with the times, but also a desire that we share to mm -hmm. stay rooted in our history and exotic animals are part of that. Mm -hmm. How much work would actually have to be done at the zoo to reconfigure the, the exhibits the way you, you envision it? And how much money would that be? Is it, is it rebuilding the whole thing from the ground up? The west side of the creek mm -hmm. that will become free open park space um, has a relatively small number of exhibits that are spread apart from each other. Mm -hmm. And two of those have been identified um, by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums as not meeting standards and in need of replacement anyways. Um, and so um, there's not too many exhibits. Some of them need to be replaced. Um, and we have another uh, recommendation from a consultant saying that the, the, degree, the dispersion of these exhibits and the long distances that people have to walk between them really recommends consolidating our exhibits in a smaller space if we want to increase visitation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've John, I'm sure over the past several months <laughs> you got input from the general public. What was the public telling? Well, I think the public was telling us uh, we loved the Duluth Zoo. We loved the experience of seeing the up-close uh, um, encounter with animals. Um, so from the society's perspective, we wanted to maintain the values that are identified in our mission statement. And I think our zoo has traditionally provided that to us as visitors. So, you know, we really see this as, a, as an opportunity to um, enhance the experience with, with people and animals. Um, when the people speak to us, I think they're most worried about uh, where we're going to become a petting zoo. Yeah. We clearly are not that. And in fact, we're maintaining the, the collection that we have and hopefully expanding upon that. So when we speak about lions and tigers and bears, oh my, uh, <laughs> we're keeping them. Sure. And the good news here is that we're going to be enhancing the exhibit area and the uh, the spaces that they're going to be within. So when we speak about keeping bears, we're going to get a better bear space than they are today because the space that Jim yeah. is speaking about is that space that doesn't meet accreditation standards today. You so took a big knock with the flood. Are you almost through now with that? Because a lot of road work going on, a new bridge just out front, outside your front door. I'd have to tell you this. I, <laughs> the staff at the zoo has done a tremendous job with this, the fact that the uh, uh, Grand Ave has been under heavy construction, but so too have all the, the various agencies that, that have been involved in, in putting that up have tried to help out the zoo in many ways, getting access into the zoo. Um, so I'd say the staff has done a tremendous job this summer. We've really seen our tenants be uh, not, we didn't take the great big dive that we thought it was going to. So 
um, that speaks to the, the value of the program at, at the zoo. And so the education side of us is really, really strong and people keep coming. Jim, how does this whole new vision for the zoo in Fairmont Park um, fit into what the city's looking at for that whole corridor along the St. Louis River? Well, what we're really excited about with mm -hmm. this concept is that it delivers four great things simultaneously. Um, one, it renews that zoo tradition and it does it in a nine to 10 acre space, which is about the same size as Como Park Zoo mm -hmm. to give people a sense. Um, it creates for the River Corridor neighborhood a top quality destination park that they have lacked and that they have been the only area of town to lack for many years. Uh -huh. um, it creates fantastic connectivity via trails between River Corridor neighborhoods, the river, the zoo, and all the parks, and it does all of that for less than half of the $40 million master plan um, that mm -hmm. was previously mm -hmm. in place. When do you expect the city council to vote on the plan? Um, we will be uh, working together with the society and the Parks Commission um, to produce, to convert this concept into a full-fledged plan by early January, um, and we hope to present it to council then. And it still would have a, a pretty sizable price tag at about $15 million, is that what I understand? We would need to raise $15 million over six years, and it will take um, both partners and our legislators um, working hard, firing on all pistons uh, yeah. to raise those dollars. But mm -hmm. the city's already dedicated 2.7, and we've already got uh, some significant asks mm -hmm. in to the state and the feds, and um, we're hopeful. All yeah. right, well, we're out of time right now, but thank you so much. I'm sure we'll have you back to talk about this as it develops a little bit more. Love thank you. Back. Thank you. Jim, thank Thanks. you very much. And we'll get your name. Time now for the week's economic news from Business North. Voters in the Grand Rapids School District rejected a proposal Tuesday that sought property tax funding for two new elementary buildings. The district lost its bid on the $80 million referendum by a nearly two to one margin. District officials said the new buildings were needed to handle a growing elementary student population, which has mushroomed by 26% in the past decade. They contend that remodeling or expanding existing facilities would cost $53 million. Former Nokomis restaurant owners Sandy Lewis and Rondi Erickson plan to construct eight homes along the North Shore. They describe their plan as a common interest community development on a 33-acre site. It will feature commonly owned trails for hiking, biking, skiing, and snowshoeing. Samala Architect has been retained to design the homes in a modern Scandinavian style. The homes are expected to be priced in the $700,000 range. Well, the U.S. Department of Energy and Minnesota Department of Commerce have issued the final environmental impact statement for the Great Northern Transmission Line. The next step for the Minnesota Power Project is a route permit decision expected next year by the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission. Now the line would also need a presidential permit which is required for the transmission line to cross the U.S.-Canadian border. The line would be used to deliver hydroelectric power from Manitoba Hydro to Minnesota power customers. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. If you have a comment about this week's show, call now, dial 218-788-2849 to leave a message or send an email to almanacnorth at wdse.org. Don't forget to check out the WDSE website for updates on your favorite programs, news about the station, events, and more. And Denny, of course, good luck to all the, the deer, I, I mean the hunters, the hunters out there. After the deer. <laughs> <laughs> 
stay safe this weekend. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't hunted in years, but I, I'm <laughs> sure a lot of people are excited about hunting this weekend. I'm sure there are some in my own family. <laughs> For Danny and the crew here at Almanac North, I'm Julie Zenner. Have a great weekend.